Good morning. I am Holly Magnuson, and this is Ask the Security Guy, and I'm here with Sean Corman. And good morning. Uh, good morning, Sean. I think I've clicked on myself where you didn't pop up. Uh, if you read the original email that we sent out last week, uh, you saw that we were going to be talking about privacy and just how much privacy do we really have on the internet. Well, we had something come up um, on Thursday that um, prompted Sean to make a change here. Uh, we had the, uh, to my knowledge, really the first time a piece of malware was able to infect one of our university computers. It came in through an email attachment from the IRS. And um, what this was, it was a variant of a, a, a virus known as CryptoWall. Um, if you've come to any of our security awareness trainings, um, you've heard of us talking about CryptoWall, and it's a pretty nasty one out there. And um, and we, we you know, we'll talk about the steps. And Sean actually even has um, the ability to show us what exactly that virus does. So as we um, go through the, you know, Sean demonstrates and everything. If you have questions, you can use the Q and A app that you should see on the right hand side of the screen. If you are watching this after the fact, because um, you'll be able to view it through YouTube, you can. Um, just shoot over an email to training at apu.edu or there's um, a place where you can leave comments and we'll be watching those and we'll get back to you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean and, you know, go ahead, Sean. Good morning. Um, so yes, we, we've had a number of successful um, malware infections over the years. Um, in fact, back in the early 2000s, we got hit by a, a bad one, a uh, bad, couple of bad ones called Blaster and Sasser. And they were a different kind. Um, they were the ones that used to be able to crawl through the network and infect machines at random. With security controls and the evolution of, of technology over the years, those kinds of, of viruses and malware and trojans aren't really as prevalent as they used to be. Um, but as we've been talking about in our security awareness classes, there's a new new kid on the block, and it's really known as ransomware. And what ransomware does is it takes normal um, Windows uh, encryption technology and encrypts your files and then locks you out of them and demands that you pay some hacker group in some unknown country a certain amount of money to get your stuff back. Now, the original was Crypto Locker. And they um, set the stage for this by developing actually a very successful business model around this. And they actually had customer service, the whole bit. They would help you get your stuff back once you had paid them. And they would help you pay them, uh, which was kind of ironic. Um, but they got a reputation for if you pay them, you will get your things back. So people were paying. Now, the way this works is, because you're locked out of your, your stuff, you can't access it. And the only way to get access to it is if you have a good backup of your files. Um, and now people have asked me, well, what if I use Google Drive or, you know, or Dropbox or Box.net or one of those online file sharing tools? Um, if you have the sync client installed on your computer, uh, for let's take Dropbox, for instance, as the most commonly used. Um, there is a copy of those files on your computer that are also stored in Dropbox. Now, what happens with Crypto Wall and Crypto Locker and this unnamed variant that we're going to look at today, um, they will see that as a local file. They'll encrypt it. The Dropbox client will see a file change and upload it to Dropbox up there. Now, if you have revision history turned on, um, which different cloud providers do it different ways. Uh, for instance, within Google Docs, you can go one by one and roll back a version. Um, I'm not sure about Dropbox. I don't use it because I don't trust it. Um, with Box.net, uh, which is very similar to Dropbox, uh, there is also a revision history tool where you can just roll back to the previous version. But if you have a large number of files, that's a one by one process to get your stuff back. And that's very difficult. What happened in our case is we had a, a user who, who deals frequently with the IRS. So the way this email came in uh, was consistent with th their normal daily activities. 
Um, and then there was a word attachment that looked legitimate and it was actually quite well done. In fact, we have a copy of the email that I would like to show you. And so you can see um, this wasn't just a, a run of the mill thing. Um, it was actually pretty good. And let me get that file open here. Just bear with me a second. So here's the email that we that came in. And there's nothing in this email that it's very carefully worded. It went right through all the spam filters. Um, but there's some there are some giveaways. Um, one is from IRS.gov, fraud department at IRS.gov. Now, Holly, you, you had shared with me some time back, you know, I, the IRS's practices on email. Um, yeah, I understand from a good source, he's an accountant, that the IRS doesn't deal with people through email. In fact, um, he shared that it's only been in the last probably less than five years that when he has a a client who is having IRS issues that he is even allowed to email the IRS but they don't use email with their their customers they may use it internally but not with you and I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and then that's that's a great point um, but we see this a lot where with phishing emails and with and this in this case you know a ransomware email um, what was done is that, you know, we're leveraging fear. We're imitating somebody who's feared and respected. It's, you know, right after the tax filing deadline. So, you know, there's a lot of things done well here. And you can see we have a case number and we have a date and instructions on how to resolve this complaint as well as a copy of the original complaint are attached in this email in a Word document right here. Now, again, the grammar is reasonably good in this one not not the poor choppy english we've we've come to expect is riddled with uh, grammatical errors that's usually a big giveaway um you know we've got a, a file attachment that looks legitimate we've got the you know the copyright stuff down at the bottom of this email which again is not legitimate but it looks like it is so there's a lot of things about this email that are pretty darn good from a get your attention standpoint. And that's, you know, unfortunately in this case, that's how we, this email got the attention of the user who, who clicked on the, the, the file and opened it. So with this file, we're, you know, we're wondering, okay, well, they opened a Word document. What happened? How, how did that infect it? And why didn't our antivirus catch it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the Word file actually, and we'll see this in a few minutes, um, actually had uh, some warnings in it. But unfortunately, in today we're inundated with you know pop-ups and warnings about this and that and the other, and it gets to be overload where where folks a lot of times don't even read the warnings; they just say okay or they click enable or whatever. And that's something else that these attackers count on. They account on that fatigue that we all have of seeing these constant, you know, pop-ups and warnings about, you know, driver issues or security alerts or this thing or the other thing. And it's hard because, you know, there are a lot of those things and, it, and, we're, and we're just trying to get the job done, whatever our job is. And I appreciate that. But at the same time, we do need to stop and we do need to take take the time to read this and understand what, what's being said because that is what attackers count on. They count on us not paying attention. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and we'll switch over to the, the victim machine I have set up for today's exercise. And this machine is a, it's, it's a special machine that I use, um, basically to blow it up. Um, it is my equivalent of Humpty Dumpty. Um, it can fall off the wall and I can put it back together pretty easily. Um, so what I've done here is I've made sure that this machine is not connected to anything except the internet. Um, that's crucial for this to work because what this Word file does as part of its um, dastardly deeds is it goes out and um, it 
grabs a file from the internet and then verifies, and we'll just be doubly sure that this is gone, um, but it grabs a file from the internet to do the actual file encryption work. And then it also, once it has the, the encryption key, it uploads it back to the file server so that they have a copy of it, but you don't. And then we'll disconnect that. Good. So we don't want it to be connected at all. All right, so that's insured. Now this machine doesn't have antivirus on it by design, um, but it wouldn't matter because I've also tested this on a machine. It did have antivirus on it. This variant of ransomware is new enough that it's not being caught yet. And it may not be caught for another couple days, but usually they'll catch up. So let's go ahead and open up this complaint document that was in the email. And pardon me, this machine is running a bit slow today. Um, not sure why, but it's about to get blown up anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Well, why the document's loading? Um, we do have a question about um, asking if the email was sent to someone in legal. And then the fact that it doesn't look relevant to anyone here at APU. So does revel relevancy have to be checked when determining when to open an email? So that's a really good question. It was not, in fact, sent to, sent to anyone in legal, but it was sent to somebody who does work with IRS-related issues. So that's how there, there was a bit of legitimacy to it. Um, however, you know, going back to Holly, what you said earlier, the IRS doesn't send emails like that. Period. So we ha we have to bear that in mind when we look at this. So do we know the source? You know, is it a legitimate source? Um, if not, look it up. Um, and if you're if you can't find anything, ask somebody. Um, we have the ISO at APU.edu email address you know, for people to ask questions like this. We have spam at APU.edu where people can forward copies of email like this. And a human being will take a look at it and verify whether or not it's legitimate. Um, but again, it a lot of times what hackers will do is they'll do a little bit of research and find out. Um, the, it's called spear phishing, where you send targeted emails to a person that you've done research on or a department that you've done research on. And they know with with the right language and the and the right subject line and message, there's a good likelihood that somebody is going to open it because they're hard to spot. So if we look over here to to the screen, we've got a couple warning indicators already. So Word is already complaining about this security warning. Macros have been disabled, and now we have to enable the content. Well, if you look at this. The document is saying, to view this document properly, press options, enable this content above. Well, that's not exactly right because it's coming up right here and asking us in this bar. Um, so that, that's a warning right there. And protected against unauthorized access. So what that's saying is this fuzzy thing here in the middle will become clear once we enable macros, right? So let's go ahead and enable content. Okay, it's thinking about it, it's thinking about it. Well, I enabled content and that box just flashed up on the screen, but I still can't see this thing. So why? So while I'm sitting here looking at this, trying to figure out why I can't make this unfuzzy, What's happening in the background is the virus has already been turned loose on my machine. And what it's doing is it is crawling through my entire hard drive, looking for Word, Excel, PowerPoint files, um, image files, anything that it can encrypt and lock me out of. And in a minute or two, what will probably happen, unless this has been taken down, nope, it's still working, a file is going to appear on my desktop called decrypt instructions. 
Very so, nice. So now let's open up decrypt instructions because this just appeared. And, you know, I'm sitting here wondering what's going on. And let's see. Sure, we'll enable that. Because we're in an enabling kind of mood today. Uh-oh. Your files were encrypted and locked with an RSA 2048-bit key. So, and... Now, to decrypt your files, download the Tor browser. And the Tor browser is a tool that allows complete anonymity online, and well, to a degree. There are holes in the Tor network that uh, we'll talk about in another session. Um, but generally speaking, Tor has legitimate uses, but it, like any good tool, it can be used for ill purposes. Um, but anyway, it says download the Tor browser and then go to this, this address within the browser. Follow the instructions and you'll receive your, the decryptor within 12 hours. You have 10 days to obtain the decryptor before the price to obtain it is doubled. Scheduled deletion of the private key from our server is in 30 days, leaving your files irrevocably broken. And here's your ID. So what happens is you will go to this site and it will prompt you with a screen for asking for your ID. And then it will ask you to pay in Bitcoin. Now, the current price on this is around five to six hundred dollars. Now, if you are late, that doubles. If you wait beyond the thirty days, chances are that key will actually be purged, and you'll never get your stuff back. So, what happened in our case was this: this got turned loose on a desktop that is here on the main campus that is connected to the L&M drives. So as part of this virus going through, and as you can see, you know, it was looking everywhere on the system. Unfortunately, there's no, I don't have a bunch of files on the system. Otherwise, you could see that they were turned to garbage. Um, but this one started crawling through our L&M drives. Now we caught it before it had gotten all the way through. And we were able to identify the machine that it was coming from, and we got that offline. And we were able to restore everything without significant loss. But that, again, is because we had a good backup that runs every night. And that's how we were able to just, you know, recover from this without too much of an interruption in service. We did have to take the file server completely offline for a couple hours last week. To deal with this and that was a significant interruption in service um, but again because we had good backups because the team over in imt engineering did a fantastic job of this the disruption of service was very very minimal compared to what it could have been so these these types of malware this is the first time i've seen it with this magnitude on our network now, I've seen and heard of lots of these getting people's home computers, getting um, laptops that were disconnected from our main network, um, and other things like that. But this is the first instance where we've had something actually go through the LM drives. Um, and it was really, you know, it was a good, a good scenario where we were able to bounce back from it quickly. Um, but there was an impact. Now, one of the things that when I first started working here, and we won't talk about how many years ago that was, that Ken Williams would always preach to the departments was keep track of what you've put into the computer that day. Because right. if there was a system crash in the middle of the day, well, the backups were taken that night. So anything you did that morning, you'd have to redo. And I mean, that we had, could see that in this situation because mm -hmm. we had to restore to the night before's backup stuff that was worked on during that that you know from eight to about what one o'clock two o'clock there when this all hit right had to be redone yep and this incident was i mean it was very unfortunate um and it was it was a targeted attack um so you know again the email was well done the attachment was well done um so this wasn't some of the run-of-the-mill stuff we all see day, day to day but as you can see from what I was able to show on my, my crash test dummy over here, 
um, it's real and it's effective and it's fast. And well, yeah. it uses built-in Windows tools to do its work, which makes it even harder for antivirus to find it and stop it. Yeah, and that, you know, like you said, you know, the question was, well, why didn't antivirus get it? Well, this is a new variant and it's changed enough that right. the virus you know, makers, you know, semantic hasn't caught up yet. Absolutely correct. I mean, antivirus and viruses is a, is a game of cat and mouse. And the antivirus is, or the virus makers are always a, a few steps ahead because they'll make a new variant with minor changes to the code. And it's going to take a couple of days for the antivirus companies. And it doesn't matter which one because they actually all work together on a lot of this stuff. Um, so it takes them a few days to catch up and distribute the new um, signatures that we can identify this new variant by. So this one is going to work for a little while. And then, you know, the antivirus will catch up and recognize it. And Google will catch up and recognize it. Um, but then, you know, they'll, the creators will make another change and we're back to square one. So really, the, the first and best line of defense is always our users. You know, you see this, if it, if it raises a red flag in your mind, send it to us, call us, and, and let us help you take a look at it and verify what it is. Because we, we have the tools and the expertise to take a look at these things in a safe environment and to determine what they really are. Sean got several questions that have popped in, so um, <laughs> okay. Let me let me start figuring out who to, where to start first. Um, the question, you know, first question I want to tackle is: Would files on Google Drive be affected by this? Yes, if you have the Drive Sync um, client installed, meaning if there's a local copy uh, on your computer. Um, that would those files would then be encrypted. Now, with Google Drive, it is recoverable, but it's one by one because Google Drive allows you to keep versions of every single file you have up there. Um, and because of the, the way the virus works, Google the Sync tool would see this as a new file version. And then you could, you know, once you get rid of the virus off your off your system, you could then just roll back. But the problem is you have to do it one by one. There is no bulk rollback. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of the Google Drive tool, so um, the Google Drive Sync tool. And so I'm, I'm thinking about the, you know, the importance for me not to get right. nailed with something like this. Yep, and I use it too. You know, it, I have most of my files stored there. Uh, this question, I like this question. So it, was, it used to be that PCs had more trouble uh, with this than Macs. Is that still true? Or are Macs as vulnerable? Um, the ransomware so far has been largely focused on PCs. There is a ransomware variant out for Macs already. Um, and to, to go back to a, a previous conversation we had about this, um, it, it's never been a case that Macs were more secure than Windows. What is the case is that Windows for a very long time had the vast majority of market share. So that's where these criminals would spend their time creating viruses and trojans and all kinds of malware for the most impact. So now as you know, Apple's market share is growing and they're taking over more and more of, the, of computing environments in the workplace and the personal sector, cr the criminals are focusing more and more of their attention there as well. Yeah, it's never been a case that they are necessarily more secure. There just weren't as many, and it wasn't worth the energy. At, yeah, for a long time, you most people felt there was no need to to install antivirus. Uh, let's see. We'll go with this one, and then we'll re. Yeah, um, the person's doc the the person's document with the infected computer were they recovered? So the computer itself was not able to be recovered. So any work that was on that computer is gone. And you know, and that's I think you know, we stress you know keeping the, the important work related files on your network shares, your L and M drive. Right. Um, because most of us, honestly, we don't back up our stuff. Right. And you know, we either get in the habit of doing that or having it on Google Drive or somewhere. Um, 
we kind of talked about this already a little bit, um, but the, the you know the remote and offline sharing um, as a possible solution. You know, Sean, you want to just kind of cover that again as far as good practices if you use something like, you know, even a crash plan or um, some kind of backup offline backup storage. Oh, a back uh, a computer backup. Yeah. Yes. So there are a number of tools out there that offer that uh, crash plan. We'll use them as an example. Um, they allow you to have um, basically a full computer backup or a partial computer backup in the cloud. And they maintain different versions, different points in time. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, uh, there are new variants of ransomware coming out that will look for that and try to connect to it. Um, but so far, they're pretty rare. But it's still the best practice of backup your computer, even if you uh, use a USB drive. Uh, that you plug in and back up your important stuff off of it to once a week, once a day, whatever. Um, but it's important to back your things up because if you have them in one location, that's a single point of failure. And we deal with that at an enterprise level here at APU. But when so many of our, our, our resources nowadays personally are electronic in some way, shape or form, we need to be thinking about that at a personal level as well. You know, if I have my home computer and all of my pictures of my son are in one spot, what happens if there's a house fire or there's a virus or there's a theft in the middle of the night and somebody came, comes and steals that computer? That's a lot of history I've lost. And that's valuable to me. Um, but we also have you know, our tax records and all kinds of other files that can be in electronic form now. Um, and a lot of us store those on our home computers. So having a good backup of that, if it's ever lost, helps us to, helps it to not be so impactful. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Crash Plan. Um, use it to for all my photography stuff and mm -hmm. backing up. And right. good to know that they're still reasonably safe. And I yeah. You know, so yeah. I do have a bit of trivia for you, Sean. All right. What virus was introduced May fifth, two thousand? May 5th, 2000. 15 years ago. It was a very popular one. Hmm. Was that Blaster? Nope. No? One more guess. I I, and I think it actually hit here at APU. And um, our network guy at the time, Jim Stoker, came in and um, saw the activity and took our email server offline and, and limited the impact. You know, I'm not sure. In May 5th of 2000, I was between, uh, actually between jobs. Um, it was the I love you virus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Worthless trivia for the day, folks. Here, here it is. No, that's funny. Uh, we do have another question. Yep. Um, is backup recommended for Google Drive files? So backup's recommended for any files. Um, with Google Drive, you it's it's kind of a, an odd conversation because Google Drive has the revision history. Now, like I said, that's a per file basis. Meaning, you know, if if a bunch of files get affected, you have to go one by one through the recovery process, and it's not infinite either. I mean, those those revisions are lost after a certain amount of time. Uh, personally, I back up everything. Whether I, regardless of where I store it. Yeah, you, you, you are, you are our, you know, we all need to aspire to be like you. <laughs> so, I'm yeah. just paranoid. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we have another question here. Um, will there be any new trainings required for individuals who may be more susceptible to opening and viewing documents sent to the university? Or will there be any training offered through IMT for anyone to participate? Do you want to answer that one or should I, Sean? <laughs> uh, why don't we both? Okay. Um, we're, we're continuing to grow the, tr the training program and we're continuing to find ways to reach out to the community uh, with useful training resources. Um, as, you know, as we mentioned before, we kicked off the Fish Me program, um, and that is where we're sending spam emails out, um, and we're you know we're we're working with targeted groups uh, right now, um, but eventually it will spread that across all faculty and staff. Um, but the purpose of that of that tool is solely education to help you spot things and to you know if if you don't successfully spot it. 
to give tools and tips that you know will will empower you to be able to you know shine a light on them and know exactly what they are the next time around um, um, and then you you were going to well, we do have our security awareness training class that we do. Mm -hmm. um, need to get some on the schedule for this summer. Um, yeah. And we, in that, we do talk about what to look for in um, in phishing emails and that type of thing. Um, and so, yeah, we have that and look for that. I will actually send that person a personal invitation just because he's a nice person, and I'd love to have him in training. <laughs> um, the next yeah. question is a little, you know, it's uh, okay. Yeah, well, I'll throw it out here. Uh, what is the link for Crash Plan, and is there a monthly fee? Um, the the link just catch up with us offline. Um, and is there a monthly fee? Yes, uh, but and I don't you, know exactly what it is off the top of my head. Well, actually, I do. It, it's about sixty dollars a year. No, okay. I use it personally, um, and that's how I'm promoting it. I you know for a university for our data here. We've got other methods I think we want to promote. Yeah, yeah. For for on-campus resources, we have a, we have we're working on other solutions. But for your personal computers, Crash Plan is a great tool. There's a few others out there as well. Uh, Carbonite is also a good yeah, one. Yes, yeah, it's a really good one. I've heard. Um, I went with Crash Plan because a friend of mine used it that I respect. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, the answer is of course yes. We'll make that happen. But could we have yeah. some training on how to do backups? Um, I think that's a great idea. Holly, we haven't talked about that, but I think that's... Yeah, I, I love the idea. So um, I did some many, many, many years ago um, and got minimal response. And mm -hmm. so I haven't tried any in recent history. So I'm game. Absolutely. And um, I have your name who wants to know, so I will find you. That'd be great. Let's reach out to them and see see what kind of uh, what kind of training they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, met our thirty minutes um, together. Um, lots of great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, just for um, a heads up, our next hangout with IMT is next Thursday at two p.m. And uh, Dante and I are doing something a little different in this one. We're actually going to have a live audience. We'll be set up in a, a classroom on West Campus. And if you're interested in being a part of that, please shoot me over an email. Um, it's We're looking forward to it. We're going to have some fun. And then we'll have final Friday wrap-up at the end of the month. And I'm sure we'll talk some more about what happened last Thursday with um, the, the virus and all that good stuff and whatever else happens this month. So are you expecting any hecklers? Uh, I'm not inviting you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> I actually, I, yeah, I would invite the boss. In fact, I need to invite the boss's boss. So, um, but you know, so we yeah, do appreciate. No, that's the one you need to worry about. <laughs> do appreciate lots of great questions today. Really appreciate that. Um, always know that if there are things you guys want to hear about, know about, let us know. You can email the um, ISO at apu.edu with that information. If you've got questions, questions about security stuff or you questionable you know emails you can email us there if you look at something and go oh wow this is a really good this is a phishing email I know it you can send that over to spam because Sean likes to you know do screen copies yeah, as a reminder if you go to support at dot apu.edu there is in the announcement section an article that Sean put screen captures of the different spam emails as they come out so if you get something and you question has Sean seen this you can look there and see what once um, and it's a great resource and if you've got family members who are always sending you emails with viruses in them feel free to send them a copy of that you know that link too mm-hmm Absolutely. So no other questions have popped up. Uh, thank you guys again. And we will see you in June where hopefully we'll be talking about privacy or whatever. It's the latest thing that happens. Well, and you're, aren't you our victim for that one, Holly? I hope so. I, I wanted to be, even though I won't actually be here for the June. I will be in Yosemite. But uh, you, can, you can still use me as the, yeah, because I would be curious to go back and see how much you actually find about me. <laughs> well, well, we'll see if we can track down some social security numbers. Yeah, I really want to know if you find those. <laughs> um, so again, we'll stop our foolishness and thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.